Tanrı'nın varlığının tasarım delili nedir? So that's really a more complicated question than it might seem. Uh, in the first place, there is no one design argument. Rather, there is a tapestry of entangled arguments extending back at least to the 5th century BCE and held together by a common theme. They're all attempts to infer the existence of God or gods by demonstrating the likely role of intelligence in shaping the world of experience. Um, the diversity is great. Design arguments have been proffered in just about every argument schema for which we have a name. Uh, but the form that was um, cited uh, in, in the question I saw um, belongs to a family that I call collectively the argument from order and which comprises the strongest set of design arguments. This set is often difficult to distinguish from closely related teleological arguments or what I would call arguments from purpose that are deeply flawed. So to best answer your question, I want to isolate what I take to be the strongest argument from order. So the strongest amongst this family of, of relatively strong design arguments. And a good way to draw out the distinction between this argument form and uh, the competitors that I said were deeply flawed is to examine its most famous presentation. That presentation is due to the Reverend William Paley. So in his 1802, Natural Theology or Evidence of the Existence and Attributes of the Deity Collected from the Appearances of Nature, Paley wrote the following, if I may quote. He said, in crossing a heath, suppose I pitched my foot against a stone and were asked how the stone came to be there. I might possibly answer that for anything I knew to the contrary, it had lain there forever. Nor would it perhaps be very easy to show the absurdity of this answer. But suppose I had found a watch upon the ground, and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place. I should hardly think of the answer which I had before given, that for anything I knew, the watch might have always been there. Yet why should not this answer serve for the watch as well as for the stone? Of course, we don't believe for a moment that the watch was always there or was the product of some geological process in the field, but rather that it was contrived and created by an intelligence. So what is it about the properties of the watch that support this dramatically distinct conclusion relative to the stone? It's because, according to Paley, the parts are, and I quote again, so formed and adjusted as to produce motion, and that motion so regulated as to point out the hour of the day that if the several parts had been differently shaped from what they are, or in any other order than that in which they are placed, either no motion at all would have been carried on in the machine, or none which would have answered the use that is now served by it. How are we to understand the structure of the argument implicit uh, in these quotes? How exactly are the observations concerning the hypothetical watches supposed to support the conclusion that there exists a designer of organisms? Right? Uh, Paley isn't really interested in talking about watches. He's interested in identifying the properties that underwrite the inference for watches uh, as properties in living things and underwriting inference to a designer of, of life, of organisms. One argument form often imputed to Paley is that of analogy. It works like this. Uh, organisms are like watches or machines in general with respect to some large list of properties, their organization, intricacy of parts, intermeshing of parts, etc. Watches have designers, this additional property. Therefore, organisms have designers. It's pretty clearly not what Paley had in mind. Paley was well aware of David Hume's evisceration of this sort of analogical design argument, and it's clear that he thought his argument free of the defects of analogy. There's plenty of textual evidence for this claim. For instance, in his sixth chapter, Paley asserts, and I promise this is the last time I'll quote, that if we had never in our lives seen any but one single kind of hydraulic machine, yet if of that one kind we understood the mechanism and use we should be as perfectly assured that it proceeded from the hand and thought and skill of a workman, as if we visited a museum of the arts and saw collected there 20 different kinds of machines for drawing water or a thousand different kinds for other purposes. 
In other words, even if we lack the experience necessary to draw an analogy between the one machine before us and anything else crafted by engineers, we would still be able to infer with confidence that it was designed. So one sample is enough for Paley, but not for analogy. So what did Paley have in mind? One view with some cachet at present is that he intended a sort of inference to the best explanation. Uh, cast in that form, the argument runs as follows. Two possible explanations for the properties found in a watch or in organisms are chance and design. The hypothesis of design makes the observed properties much more likely than they would be if produced by chance processes. Therefore, the watch or organism was designed. This interpretation is favored by a variety of authors who independently favor inference to the best explanation as a strong mode of inductive inference in general. To the critic of inference to the best explanation, this interpretation of Paley inherits all the weaknesses of this mode of inference. Yeah, there's no clear sense of what best, uh, a sense of best, unequivocally tracks truth. Each such inference might only identify what Bosman Frossen called the best of a bad lot. And formulations involving likelihood encourage one to commit the base rate fallacy, etc. So, is the argument from order as Paley intends it encumbered in this way? While some of my colleagues have offered cogent arguments to the contrary, I don't think Paley intended anything like an inference to the best explanation. Aside from the anachronism, a look at Paley's source material indicates he has in mind a sort of deductive argument. You see, William Paley was something of an intellectual magpie. Most of natural theology was cobbled together from a number of existing sources similarly for many of his preceding books. He directly borrowed the entire discussion of the watch that I began with, uh, the watch on Heath, from Bernard Neuentate's religious philosopher. The latter is quite explicit about the deductive nature of the final stage of inference. So here's one more rendering of Paley's argument uh, that is deductive, and I would suggest faithful to Paley's text. First premise. Features of organisms such as eyes and ears exhibit a purpose. Second, purpose implies a designer. And third, therefore, there exists a designer of living things. Well, at face value, this is what I would have called an argument from purpose or a teleological argument, that family of arguments I warned about at the outset. Uh, this form is unsatisfactory as it suffers from an irreparable defect that was first clearly articulated by the 19th century geologist, Lewis Hicks. The problem is that if purpose means the end to which a designer crafted a thing, then in the first place, arguing for a designer by appealing to an observation of purpose begs the question, you, you have assumed what you aimed to demonstrate. Second, purpose is inferred, not observed. Really, says Hicks, when we speak of the purpose uh, which we see, uh, to which we see the parts of the watch contribute, what we really mean is the function, what the thing actually does. The argument appears compelling in the form I just gave it because we conflate function with purpose uh, uh, to then infer a design. Exegesis aside, though, we're interested in the strongest form the argument can take. So we want to identify an argument from order that doesn't beg the question. With the preceding argument from purpose as a starting point, we can see that we need to identify a special sort of function, one that stands in the right relationship to intelligent agency. Paley's examples suggest that we focus on what I'll call goal-directed functions. Uh, I, I warn the listener that there is a rich literature on teleology that intersects with the literature from cybernetics in the 50s and 60s, uh, in which lots of people define terms like goal, purposive behavior, and teleological, and everyone define them differently. This is a sweet, generous definition. We'll call it goal-directed. To avoid the same circularity that afflicts purpose, we'll spell out goal-directedness like this. If many parts contribute to a function, and small variations of the properties of most of those parts would preclude the function, then we can say that the system under consideration is goal-directed with respect to that function. Now the argument can be reconfigured like this. 
many systems in each organism are goal-directed. This is an observational fact. Goal-directed systems can only be produced by design. Therefore, there exists a designer of organisms. I do think this is a roughly what Paley had in mind. Um, I don't want to oversell the sophistication of this argument as I presented it in three statements. It's a trivial deductive inference, not exactly Andrew Wiles' proof of Fermat's last theorem. But its formal simplicity does avoid many problems faced by its competitors. What does demand sophistication and subtlety is the justification of that second premise, the claim that goal-directed systems can only be produced by design. The clever innovation of Paley, or rather Newman Tate, was to offer a clearer articulation of the sort of order that is plausibly connected to intelligence in the right way than did any of his predecessors. So how well does this goal directedness fare as a mark of intelligent agency? Uh, Robert Boyle took the connection as obvious. Since chance cannot produce goal directedness in the sense, any instance of such must be the product of intelligence. It seems that Paley thought it obvious too. He only points out the features of the watch that are sufficient for inferring intelligent agency. He offers no argument as to why we should believe this association. But how plausible is the claim that goal-directed functions can only be produced via intelligent agency? Well, it should come as no surprise to a modern listener that the Darwinian revolution in biology significantly weakened the plausibility of this key premise. At the very least, natural selection is a conceptual possibility. As any of the many simulations of blind selection available on the internet demonstrates, it's conceptually possible to generate goal-directed functions without intelligent action. So the connection between intelligence and goal-directedness, at least as I've defined it, is not analytic. It's not a necessary consequence of the meanings of those terms. Furthermore, a century and a half of work in evolutionary biology provides compelling evidence that in fact, the goal-directedness observed in biological adaptations is the consequence of mindless causal processes. So it seems that a connection between goal directedness and mind is not a contingent fact either. So where does this leave us? I said that design arguments are really a rich family of arguments and that the argument from order is the strongest of the bunch. And I just said that evolutionary biology took the legs out from under Paley's version of the argument from order. But I'm not suggesting we abandon the study of design arguments. Rather, I think it's worth attempting to fix the argument from order. Let me explain. A posteriori arguments such as design arguments offer arguably the only compelling line of reasoning for someone who does not already believe in the tenets of a theistic faith. Of the design arguments, the argument from order is the least encumbered by logical difficulties. But to be successful, it requires a reliable, if not indubitable, mark or trace of the action of intelligent agency. How could such a mark be established? Well, think of thermodynamics. We believe that certain chemical reactions cannot occur spontaneously. That is without the external input of energy. And we believe this on the grounds of thermodynamic theory. We have a theory of the transformation of energy that tells us if I observe a certain reaction taking place, then I can infer the influence of the external influence of, of uh, an input of energy. It's conceivable we might develop a theory of intelligence that similarly precludes the possibility of certain physical states of affair absent intelligent intervention. The failure of our notion of goal directedness derived from the special features of a class of functions that William Paley emphasized casts a bright light on two fundamentally unanswered questions. The first, is what exactly do we mean by intelligence and the broader concept of mentality? What is an intelligent agent? The second asks, in light of the nature of intelligence, is there a reliable way to detect intelligence from its traces? These are logically independent questions. We may have a theory of intelligence that doesn't rule anything in or out. Uh, and conversely, we might settle on uh, a trace of intelligence without having a good theory of what exactly an intelligent agent is. But at present, 
we don't have compelling answers to either of these. The fact that we aren't sure whether to believe the implications of a fish passing the mirror test, as happened a couple of years ago, or whether large language models like ChatGPT, the talk of the last few weeks, demonstrate intelligence, or demonstrate the shocking shallowness of our own intelligence, indicates how far we have to go in answering those two questions. So finally, we return to the original question. What is the design argument? Well, at present, it's mostly a collection of moribund attempts to connect empirical features of the world to the likely activity of an intelligent agent worthy of the appellation God. The argument from order, however, remains in its simplicity a fruitful pursuit for the theist and atheist alike. Determining whether a viable version of the key premise of that argument, that is identifying a reliable mark of intelligent agency, means answering some central vexing questions about mind and nature. Whatever the outcome, it's worth doing. So I'd say that at present, asking what the design argument is, is really a sort of invitation to engage a very long tradition of philosophical debate about the possibility of inferring God from nature and to see it through to its logical conclusion.